All right, well, this morning <clears throat> we're continuing in Luke's gospel, and we're going to look at the account, as I've already mentioned, of uh, the crossing of the uh, uh, Lake Gennesaret, uh, the Sea of Galilee, the, um, um, uh, well, and Jesus' uh, stilling of the wind and the waves. Uh, it's just really a few verses, uh, but as we know, um, we could really spend our whole lives really plumbing the depths of what's here, and we're certainly not going to do that this morning. But let me read the text and again, to see the points that we've already um, been looking at or thinking about, who Jesus is and the importance of trusting him, uh, that he is able to do what he said he would do because of who he is. So Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 22. Now, on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat and he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out, but as they were sailing along, he fell asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. They came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the wind and the water, and they obey him? Well, may the Lord bless uh, this uh, portion of his word to our uh, building up in Christ this morning. You know, on one occasion, Jesus turned to his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, and he asked the question, Who is it that men say that I am? And if we were to ask that question today, we, of course, would get a variety of responses. I think most people today, if you were to ask most people on the street, at least in the Western culture, they would say, we don't think Jesus ever existed. Uh, most people today, I think, um, although they would say this, but we know from the Bible this isn't really true, are atheists. They don't believe that God exists. And so if God doesn't exist, Jesus really couldn't be. Uh, he couldn't really exist. He's really a myth created by the Jews who believed in a supreme being and wanted to believe the supreme being sent the Messiah into the world. Today they see him as nothing more than a character in a book used by the church basically to teach moral lessons and to encourage people to have hope and maybe to give them direction in life. You know, as Mark said, religion is the opiate of the people. It's meant just to sort of keep us happy while we're being oppressed until we can leave this world. Well, some people believe that Jesus was real, but he is not as the Bible describes him. He's essentially just a man. You know, even in the church, theological liberals, they believe that Jesus was just a man, a good teacher. Neo-Orthodoxy believes essentially the same thing. A wise teacher, admired by his followers to the point where they deified him in their writings. You know, Boltmann says, we want to find the true Jesus. We need to strip away all the layers of legends and myths that have sort of surrounded him until we get to the very kernel, which is the truth. Jesus really lived, but he was just a man. Others believe that he's a prophet, but maybe one prophet among many, like Islam believes, um, sent to show us the way to God. But then there are those like us who believe that the Bible is God's word and we believe that what the Bible says about Jesus is true. We know that he is more than a prophet. We know that he's more than a mere man. We know that he is the only begotten Son of God, God the Son in our nature, the one the Father sent into this world to save us from the guilt of our sins, remember, through his sacrifice, but also to free us from the power of sin by his Holy Spirit so that we might live for him and eventually go to be with him in heaven. I think we could all agree that what we believe about Jesus really does matter. If we believe that he never existed, we really wouldn't give him another thought, which is what most people do, as I've said. If we believe he was merely a man who taught some good things, we might read what he, what he said, as it's been recorded for us in Scripture, try to learn a little bit of wisdom for living, but we really won't look any further uh, than that. If he's one prophet among many, we might look to him, or to one of the other prophets to show us the way to God. But if we do believe that he is who he claimed to be, 
the Son of God in our nature, the only one who can reconcile us with the Father, the one who controls everything, then we will look to him not only to save us and to reconcile us with the Father, but we will look to him for everything else that we need in life as well. Well, this morning, Jesus, knowing that his disciples still didn't have quite a clear understanding, even though he had given to them plenty of evidence as to who he actually was and what he could actually do, he gives them a demonstration of his authority to strengthen their faith, to strengthen their trust in him. And perhaps uh, this morning the Lord will use this to remind us of who he is and to strengthen our faith in him as well. This morning I want us to look at three things from this text. First of all, that Jesus shows us his authority over the creation. Secondly, he graciously corrects his disciples for their fear, which was essentially a lack of faith, a lack of trust. And then thirdly, that through these events, they begin to understand more about who Jesus actually is and why it is they can trust him. In other words, their strength or their faith can actually be strengthened uh, as they understand who Jesus is and what it is he's actually willing to do. Now, first of all, Jesus shows them his authority over the creation. Uh, Luke begins in verse 22. Let me read this again. Now, on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat. And he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. Now, we know uh, from what happens next, at least in what we read following this passage, that Jesus was going across this lake, which again is the Sea of Galilee, to minister to a man who was on the other side, a man who was possessed by the legion. That's what we're going to look at next time. But we also know from what happens uh, on the lake that Jesus was going this direction because he was intending to teach his disciples a lesson on the way. Luke writes next in verse 23. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. You know, the first thing I want us to note here is this, that uh, Jesus was sleeping in the boat, okay, which means a couple of things. It means that he wasn't afraid of what was going to happen. You know, I believe that Jesus knew it was going to happen. He knew they were going to make it across. He knew that everything was going to turn out all right. I think he, of course, knew that, that this was going to happen in order to teach his disciples a lesson. And we might ask the question, of course, how did Jesus know this? And we know it, first of all, because this was not the way Jesus was going to die, right? Jesus came into the world to complete a specific mission. That mission was not yet completed. The mission was that he would lay down his life a ransom for many, shed his blood. Drowning doesn't shed your blood. And he knew that until that time came, there was nothing that could take his life away from him. His father would certainly make sure of that. Secondly, he, he knew that what was about to happen was according to his father's plan. And he knew what the outcome was going to be. Now, that, I think that's easy for us to understand because you know, we know who Jesus is. Jesus is God in our nature. We expect Jesus to know these things. But we also need to come to grips with what the Bible says about Jesus in other places. That Jesus, as a man, did not really know everything. Jesus did not have access to infinite knowledge. There were certain things that were kept from Jesus while he was in this world again, because of the, the limitations of his human mind or his human brain. I mean, for one thing, the day and the hour of his coming that he talks about in the Olivet Discourse, right? Of that day and that hour, no one knows, not uh, the angels, not the Son of Man, but the Father only. Um, again, certain things that Jesus didn't know. And yet, there were certain things Jesus did know, right? Because divine knowledge was being communicated to him by that anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was basically giving him the things that he needed to know when he needed to know them. And so Jesus, he, he basically told Jesus what he needed to know in these circumstances so that he might comfortably 
sleep in the boat, in the middle of the sea, knowing that a storm was coming, and oddly enough, even while the storm was swamping the boat with waves, Jesus was still asleep. He was completely unconcerned because of his trust in his Father. And really, having seen what Jesus had already done, the disciples shouldn't have been concerned either. We need to realize this was a test that was meant to see just how much they really did trust the Lord. If Jesus says, we're going to go to the other side of the lake, they should have trusted him that they were going to arrive at the other side of the lake. Now, eventually, the disciples would have a stronger faith. But this is one of the ways that the Lord would make it grow by putting them in circumstances that would stretch them to the limit. And I think we understand the Lord does that for us as well. Well, as they were sailing, we read that a strong wind suddenly kicked up. I think we would call this a squall, you know, a strong gust of wind which lasts for perhaps more than just a moment. And it begins to churn up the waves, and the waves begin to crash over the bow of the boat and swamp the boat. Apparently, this wasn't an uncommon thing to happen on the Sea of Galilee, nor would it have been so uncommon for sailors to drown in this kind of weather. And the disciples, I think quite naturally, were afraid that they were going to die. Now, you know, put yourself in, in their circumstances. Maybe you've been in their circumstances before. I think we've all experienced something like this. Is these examples that I'm going to give you are things that I've experienced. Have you ever been in a boat in the middle of a storm? Well, I've been on a pontoon boat in the middle of an electrical storm on a lake. That's not exactly a very safe situation to be in. Although in that case, I think I, didn't, I was ignorant of the danger, so it wasn't quite as um, intimidating. Do you ever get caught in a riptide or an undertow? You know, things like this can make you think you're going to drown. How about on the edge of a cliff? Maybe you were climbing a mountain. Maybe you were crossing a bridge. You know, there are some bridges that uh, Brian and I know about that are, that are quite uh, fearful to cross. And we were afraid that we were going to fall. We were going to fall to our death. Now, situations like these make us very uncomfortable, don't they? Because they give us a sensation of fear or of terror. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. We don't know the outcome. We're afraid. Well, what are we supposed to do in situations like this, well, we're going to see that there's one thing that the disciples should have done and something we should do as well, which is trust the Lord up front. But not having trusted him, we need to do what the disciples did in this case. Look to the one, the only one, who can actually help you. And that's what they did. Luke 8, verse 24. They came to Jesus, and they woke him up saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. They thought... They were going to die. They were on the edge. They were on the brink. They thought everything was over. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is that they came to Jesus, and they expected that Jesus would be able to do something about it, not surprisingly. Maybe he would help them somehow control the boat, uh, somehow ride out the storm, somehow get safely to shore, maybe show them some way to escape. But apparently they had no idea that he could do what he did next. Luke writes in, again in verse 24, and he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. Now, the disciples to this point had seen Jesus do many things. They saw him cast out demons. We're going to see him do that again next time. He cleansed the lepers. He healed the sick. He even did it at a distance. Remember when the centurion servants came to Jesus and said, my servant is sick, come and heal him, and, but you don't have to come to my house. Well, Jesus can even heal at a distance. He, um, they had seen him raise the dead. They had seen him command fish in the sea into the nets so that the nets were full. They had seen Jesus' power over living things. But I think what's unique here is that Jesus now commands things that aren't alive, I mean, sometimes the wind and the waves are personified in the Scripture, but we realize that's just personification. The world is groaning, you know, and uh, in pangs like in childbirth, but the world is not really in labor, okay? It's personification. It isn't alive. Jesus here now commands the creation itself. 
things that aren't alive, and they obey him. They had no idea, apparently, that he could do this. He commands them, and they immediately obey. Now, that, first of all, is Jesus' demonstration of his authority over the creation. The creator has authority over what he has made. And uniquely, I think, in Jesus' situation, everything is unique, uh, even in his state of humiliation, he has authority over sickness, he has authority over life, he has authority over the demons, he has authority over what has been made. Now, the second thing we see here is that Jesus then corrects them. I think graciously, of course, because his motive was, was gracious. For they're not believing and they're not trusting him. Uh, Luke writes in verse 25, and he said to them, where is your faith? Essentially, he was asking, you, you had it before, where, where did it go? You know, is this all it takes to sort of steal your faith away from you? And again, remember what it is that the disciples had seen up to this point. I mean, they, they did know that, at least at some level, that he was the expected one, that he was the Messiah. Remember what John said at Jesus' baptism? This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Remember the messengers of John the Baptist had already come to Jesus and asking the question, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? And Jesus said, go report to John what you've seen and heard. And he lists all the miracles that he had been performing. They saw everything that Jesus had done to this point, all of his miracles, the authority with which he was teaching. They even knew this was fulfilling the prophecy regarding Messiah. They knew that Jesus never failed to accomplish whatever it is he set out to do. And, of course, it was his plan to cross the lake, and yet they still didn't believe him. They still didn't trust him, that he would be able to bring them there, at least not during the storm. I, you know, this was a test where Jesus is asking the disciples, are you going to trust me even if it looks like what I said isn't going to take place, even if it looks like death is going to stop us? Are you still going to believe me? Well, they didn't, okay? They didn't trust him. Now, we need to be careful here because, uh, you know, we can be critical of the disciples, but I think we all have to admit, if we were in their situation, we would have done the same thing. And, you know, the fact is, we actually do the same thing every day of our lives, don't we? We, we, we know what Jesus is capable of doing. We know that he's able to save us. That's the reason why we trusted Jesus to save us to begin with. We know that Jesus is able to provide for us. You know, uh, we're here, right? Which means that we've had everything we've needed to survive from the time we came into this world to the present. And he's the one who actually gave us these things. We know that the Lord is able to work all things together for our good, as he promises through the Apostle Paul. All we need to do is look back through the history of our lives and see that every difficulty that we had to face, the Lord has brought us through and he has worked some good through it that has helped us become more like him. We know from our experience what he says in his word is true, and yet how often do we not trust him when the next situation comes? How often are we afraid that we're not going to make it to heaven, that we're not going to have what we need, that the situations that we're faced with are not going to turn out well, and that the word of God really isn't true. I mean, how many times do we think about that during the day, especially when we see all the atheistic stuff around us that is trying to disprove what the Bible says, and we find ourselves at these crises. How many times do we fail to trust the Lord? How many times has our faith left us when he brings things into our lives to challenge or to test our faith? I think we all need to admit that like these disciples, we need to grow in our faith. We need to grow in our trust of the Lord. But the question is, how can we do this? Well, I think one very important way is we need to get a clearer view of who Jesus really is. And that's, I think, what we see next. Finally, the disciples begin to ask the right questions and begin to understand a little bit more about Jesus. We read in verse 25, they were fearful at what had just happened, the stilling of the calming. And they were amazed, saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? You know, the one thing that, um, that the Bible tells us or shows us is that miracles 
were done to have a, a specific effect on those who saw them. It was meant to create wonder or amazement, right? And you know, the, the, the actual meaning of those words is to terrify. When somebody is full of wonder, they're just like, you know, they're, they're amazed, but not in this delightful kind of way, but rather they are afraid, terrified at what they've just seen. Things like this don't ordinarily happen. When something like this happens, it means that somebody is present and that somebody is God. God must be in this. That's the reason why Jesus gave to his disciples the authority to do miracles when he sent them out to preach his word. It wasn't just to minister to the people, but it was to let the people who were listening to them know that the message they were preaching actually came from God. Now, what about this particular situation? What's the difference? Well, uh, the difference, I think, is this, that here is somebody who wasn't doing these things in the name of the Lord, but rather was doing these things on his own authority. Now, they already know, as I've said, who Jesus was. He's the expected one. He's no ordinary prophet. He's the one he claims to be, the Son of Man. He's the Messiah. He is the Son of God. But I think this event served to bring that reality even more into their consciousness, as it were. You know, sometimes the Lord, uh, we, we sort of get drowsy, and we sort of uh, lose sight of certain things about Jesus, about reality, and we kind of begin to go along with perhaps the direction the world is going, but sometimes the Lord does something to shock us back into reality, into realizing uh, that what we know to be true actually is true. He wakes us up. Now, if the disciples had been thinking about who Jesus is in these particular terms, which, remember, Jesus uh, implied that they should have by his mild rebuke of them, they might have been a bit calmer when the storm hit. They might have been thinking as, as these things were taking place, you know, I'll bet you this is another test. <laughs> Jesus is testing us to see if we are going to believe him. And it, perhaps if they had been thinking in those terms, knowing, of course, that Jesus had to accomplish his mission and who Jesus was, maybe they could have ridden that storm out uh, with a bit more calm. They might have trusted him a bit more to save them rather than being terrified for their lives. And really, I think that's the crux of the matter, isn't it? I mean, what, what value does trust have or faith have if it's not directed towards someone that you believe has the power to do something about that situation and that he not only has the power to do it, but out of his grace and his mercy and his love is willing to do something about it. You know, we need to understand who Jesus is. We need to know what Jesus is capable of doing. And we need to believe that in his love towards us, that he will do what needs to be done in our lives, that he will take care of us here and that he will bring us safely to heaven. And while we're on our way, he'll make sure that we have everything that we need and he will protect us. You know, believers in the past, I think about um, Stonewall Jackson. I think he was called Stonewall because he was basically immovable. He was the one who would basically sit there on his horse while the bullets were flying around him and he wouldn't move because he believed that he was just as safe in that particular situation as he would be if he were asleep in his bed surrounded by his four walls. He knew his life was in the Lord's hands. Uh, that's the kind of trust that the Lord wants us to have in him, the kind that will trust him in every circumstance. But to have that, we need to know he's trustworthy we need to know that he's inclined to help us. He wants to help us. He will help us. We need to trust that he actually will. And if we do this, it really will take away our fear. We won't need to be afraid. May the Lord give us the grace uh, then to be able to trust him more and to, to learn this lesson. Again, the Father says if he was willing to give Jesus to us, what will he withhold from us? We need to believe that that's true, and we need to trust Him. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us do that.